Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Integrating Non-Invasive Blood Pressure Monitoring with Human Physiology Measurements. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is sponsored by Biopack Systems and CN Systems and will focus on the specific hardware and software requirements along with best practices for successful integration of non-invasive blood pressure with additional physiological signals. First, we will be joined by Walter, Walter Habenbacher, Head of Sales and Marketing at CN Systems Medical in Graz, Austria. Today, Mr. Habenbacher will discuss the value of continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitoring and how this can be done using the NIBP 100D monitor. He will review equipment setup, operation, and discuss how continuous non-invasive blood pressure monitoring can benefit your research. Following, we will be joined by Fraser Finley, CEO of Biopack Systems Incorporated in Goleta, California. Today, Mr. Finley will present how researchers can integrate non-invasive blood pressure monitoring with additional physiological measurements, such as electrocardiography, electrodermal activity, and respiration, to name a few. Specifically, he will demonstrate how to interface the NIBP100D with the Biopack MP160 data acquisition system, and from there, collect and analyze these signals using important software functions included in Acknowledge software. Good morning everyone and uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, in today's presentation I'll show you how to uh, measure non-invasive blood pressure and other hemodynamic parameters um, using the NIPP 100D unit. It's also referred to as uh, CNAP Monitor 500 for clinical applications. And um, we will also discuss how these uh, measurements can be beneficial for your uh, research projects. So I'm sure most of you agree that uh, blood pressure is uh, amongst the uh, most important cardiovascular parameters, um, especially as it drives uh, perfusion uh, of blood throughout the human circul circulatory system. Um, so the big question is really why do we want or need to measure it continuously. Um, traditional ways to uh, measure blood pressure in humans uh, provide you with snapshots of blood pressure readings only. So typically oscillometric or auscultatory uh, ways to measure blood pressure use a uh, upper arm cuff which is um, wrapped around the patient's or subject's upper arm. Uh, the pressure in the cuff is inflated above uh, systolic pressures and then deflated over time and the pulsations that are sensed in the uh, upper arm cuff are then correlated with pressure and uh, so you will get like uh, blood pressure readings for systolic, diastolic and mean blood pressures every few minutes uh, but with a very poor resolution so typically every one or uh, up to three or five minutes only. Um, bear in mind also the following facts. Um, the quality of uh, upper arm cuff measurements depends uh, really on the sizing of the, of the upper arm, arm cuff. So there is a circumference mark which should match the, the subject's uh, arm circumference. And then there is also a radial artery marker uh, that should be aligned with the brachial artery to make sure that the pulses are detected well. Um, secondly, um, frequent upper arm cuff measurements are annoying and painful for subjects and can even have uh, influence on other parameters that you're monitoring. And uh, uh, third, it is, it is assumed that uh, blood pressure remains constant during the time of measurement with an upper arm cuff, which is usually 30 seconds. Um, however, when you add the continuous information, you will see that blood pressure is never stable, but it can change beat by beat. And actually, um, due to stimuli, mental stress, exercise, and whatsoever, um, so the only way to track these changes in blood pressure properly is uh, to track blood pressure beat by beat and continuously. Um, so today I want to show you one way of doing that using the NIPP 100D unit. Um, basically the unit uh, uses a finger sensor which is placed on the patient's index and middle finger. They come in three sizes and the finger sensor really measures the patient's blood pressure waveform in the fingers. Um, we have a so-called forearm controller which is fixed to the patient's forearm with a Velcro and connected with the finger sensor. Um, CNAB uses a traditional upper arm cuff to calibrate for brachial pressures at heart level. 
And then the fourth uh, uh, part of the component is actually the brain, uh, the monitor, which is used to display uh, signals to uh, control the measurement and also to interface uh, with other equipment, for example, the NI, uh, MP150, 160 systems from PowerPack. Um, the signals that are generated are, include the blood pressure waveform, uh, which has a very high fidelity. It's measured at uh, 100 hertz, so 100 samples per second, and matches with uh, a general blood pressure waveform morphologies, as you might know it from um, um, invasive arterial lines. Um, the unit gives you beat-by-beat -beat parameters like pulse rate, systolic, diastolic, and mean blood pressures. And in the latest software versions, we can also do cardiac output and online stroke volume from that same sensor. And finally, um, systemic vascular resistance is uh, calculated from mean blood pressure and cardiac output values. So a complete and hemodynamic monitoring out of the same finger sensor. Let's have a quick look at uh, patient setup. So basically, to select the right size of finger sensor, um, simply align the patient's index or middle finger with the color label on the forearm controller, use the proximal limb. Um, once you have selected the right sensor connected with the forearm unit, uh, make sure it goes all the way up on the patient's fingers, so on the proximal limb, avoid the knuckles. And uh, before closing the strap on the forearm controller, make sure the slider is in the middle position because it will allow some arm movement. Um, the upper arm cuff, uh, to calibrate CNAP can go ipsy or contralateral, so same or opposite arm. Make sure the uh, circumference uh, uh, of the cuff uh, matches the circumference of the patient's arm and make sure the radial marker is in appropriate position. So once uh, the uh, finger sensor is set up, uh, you will see the start measurement dialog appear. Um, simply select either to continue a measurement or to start a new measurement. Um, as soon as you start the measurement, you will see on the bottom left corner the so-called pulsation index pop-up. Um, it can go up to six notches of green uh, and it indicates the perfusion or blood flow in the patient's fingers. As long as the PI goes green, we will get a measurement. If PI stays red, uh, you need to check the setup or cuff sizing. Um, select patient category uh, to adjust the inflation pressures of the upper arm cuff. And if we are to include hemodynamic monitoring, um, also select the um, patient parameters like uh, gender, age, height, and weight, which are used for biometric calibration um, of cardiac output. As soon um, as the signal is uh, perfect, the uh, unit starts to inflate the upper arm cuff and to calibrate CNA. So we can see the inflation pressures coming up. Um, it's inflating above systolic pressures, and then the cuff starts to deflate. Um, the pulsations in the cuffs are now measured and correlated with cuff pressures. And typically, the first pulsation correlates with systolic pressures. Um, the highest pulsations correlate with mean blood pressure and the lowest pulsation or last pulsations correlate with diastolic blood pressure. After the NIPP reading is complete, uh, which is almost now, we'll get the blood pressure reading, 127 over 87. And before calibration is applied, the signal is optimized one more time to make sure we get a nice waveform. As soon as calibration is applied, you will see the great background go away here, and then the unit runs continuously for blood pressure. Um, for hemodynamic monitoring, it takes another 20 seconds to come on. Um, the system is actually doing a pulse contour analysis of the blood pressure waveform, um, applies the biometric calibration with the gender, age, weight, and the height of the patient, and comes on now. So for this uh, particular subject, 46 years of age, uh, 90 kilos, 184 centimeters, we'll get a cardiac output of, of about 5.6 liters per minute. Uh, stroke volume is around 84 milliliters, and uh, vascular resistance is around 1,400 dying units. Um, 
Now that uh, we understand which uh, hemodynamic parameters uh, the NIPP 100D can provide, let's also have a look how it works. Um, so the secret actually lies inside the finger sensor, which is equipped with a light signal and a pressure cuff, a small pressure cuff like an upper arm cuff. So the light signal basically picks up the uh, blood volume and blood flow in the patient's fingers, um, which is actually modulated by the blood flow. Um, then the light signal is used to um, inflate and deflate the pressure cuff, which is in integrated in each of the sensors. And uh, the pressure cuff really follows true finger blood pressure in the subject's fingers and generates a continuous blood pressure waveform with high uh, precision and morphology. The only thing is this is really finger blood pressure and what you want to refer to is really blood pressure in the large artery at heart level and that is the reason why we apply the upper arm cuff calibration. So uh, with, this, with these uh, calibration values, systolic and diastolic and mean pressures are aligned and we'll get accurate readings here. So in a quick summary, let me share that in an animation. Slide the finger sensor on the patient's fingers, attach it to the forearm controller, light signal goes through the patient's fingers, more or less light is uh, absorbed through the blood flow and uh, the pressure cuff is controlled by the signal. And then uh, with the calibration applied from the upper arm cuff, we'll get high precision blood pressure waveform and we'll get beat by beat systolic, mean and diastolic blood pressure values and, and in the latest software we'll also have advanced hemodynamic parameters like stroke volume, cardiac output, vascular resistance. So quick, easy and fully calibrated. Setting up uh, CNAP for your specific measurements is really easy. Um, all you need to do is plan your test duration and this, in this example I've taken like 30 minutes. Um, let's add a little startup uh, and setup uh, phase in the beginning of about five minutes that will allow patient setup and full calibration of the system. Let's also allow for a buffer of five minutes in the end. So in total for example we'll have like 40 uh, minutes of recording time. So the only thing we need to do now is adjust the, um, the finger sensor or the, the switching of the finger sensor. Um, as you've seen, the finger sensor is actually a double finger cuff, so it, can, it works on one or the other finger at a time. And to avoid finger switching, we'll just adjust the interval to longer than the 40 minutes. And we'll do the same thing for the upper arm cuff and adjust it to 40 minutes. Um, so it will give us uninterrupted measurements and highly reproducible and calibrated results. Although uh, CNAP or the NIPP 100D is a research tool, it has full medical approval, so CE, FDA approval. Um, with regards to hemodynamic monitoring and the latest software, we have fully CE approved, um, while FDA is still pending. Um, validation of our products and parameters is typically done in clinical settings versus invasive uh, gold standards or clinical gold standards. So for blood pressure, for example, this would include an invasive arterial line. For cardiac output, even uh, invasive transpulmonal thermodilution. Um, in the chart here, you can see that uh, over the time, over the course of time, uh, more than 500 publications in peer-reviewed uh, journals um, uh, um, have been published using our technology. And when we look into um, particular publications for the NIPP 100D unit, um, we could have collected about 100 publications uh, through 2015. Um, any of you interested in particular validation results for blood pressure and cardiac output are most welcome to contact us and up through our website. And I think you will also have a chance uh, through Inside Scientific to get our contact details. Um, one of the most impressive uh, tests to see the uh, unit's performance uh, to track fast changes in blood pressure and also uh, heart rate or pulse rate is the so-called Balsalva maneuver. So basically what the subject is doing here is taking a deep breath 
and trying to exhale forced against uh, closed uh, nose and mouth. So this increases infratoracic pressure and causes fast changes in blood pressure and pulse rate. The Valsalva maneuver is really used as a diagnostic tool for autonomic function. And uh, let me walk, talk you through a, uh, a physiologic response, a normal physiologic response on the Valsalva. So the first phase is actually called uh, initial blood pressure rise. And this is when you take the deep breath and try to exhale against closed uh, mouth and nose. Uh, the intrathoracic pressure is increased. And uh, so actually um, the pulmonary cir circulation is also compressed. It presses uh, uh, blood out of the heart. Stroke volume is increased and we'll see blood pressure increased. In phase two, um, we'll see a slight drop in blood pressure and that is because um, there's still pressure on your chest and it, uh, it uh, impedes the blood, uh, blood flow back to the heart. So stroke volume and cardiac output are actually dropping down and so is blood pressure. It's called phase 2A. And in phase 2B, uh, it's called the compensation uh, phase. Uh, this is where typically pulse rate increases. So uh, we can see that nicely from, from the graph here. Pulse rate closes up, it gets higher and higher. And uh, we'll also see a peripheral vasoconstriction. So more blood returns back to the heart. Um, and blood pressure is actually almost uh, able to level out. Uh, then in phase three, this is where uh, subject starts to breathe normally. So the compression of the chest is gone. Um, and uh, the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary veins, uh, pulmonary vessels and the aorta start to re-expand. And due to the poor filling, uh, we see the drop in blood pressure. And then finally, in the phase four, we'll see the return of cardiac output. So the blood, blood that has been damped back by the compression now re-enters the heart. We'll see incre increase in stroke volume and cardiac output and a nice overshoot in blood pressure. And then over the time, over the course of 20, 30 seconds, we will see blood pressure level out again. So this is a very uh, impressive uh, maneuver. Um, now uh, let's have a live example on the scene app, what that looks like. Let's start it here. So this is where the subject takes, takes the deep breath, the pressure increases, then uh, phase 2A, uh, re impedant uh, venous return, blood pressure goes down, um, 2B, compensation, so we'll see a uh, pulse rate increase, vasoconstriction, and then when the pressure is gone, uh, first drop in pressure and then a nice overshoot phase uh, from the blood returning to the heart. So you can see uh, CNAP is really able to track these changes beat by beat, very accurate with a high fidelity blood pressure waveform. In the next couple of slides, uh, let me try and convince you uh, as to why uh, monitoring of advanced hemodynamic parameters uh, also could be beneficial for your research projects. Um, some of you uh, might uh, know the Ohm's law from electricity linking voltage, current, and electrical resistance. Um, when we apply that to physiology, it actually links the correlation between blood pressure, blood flow, and vascular resistance. And so in a very simplified uh, way, we can say blood pressure is actually regulated from heart rate, stroke volume, and vascular resistance. Um, Typically, there is uh, more ways to control blood pressure, and they are usually clustered in uh, short-term uh, uh, mechanisms, which include baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, for example, intermediate-term mechanisms, which include the renin angiotensin system, or even long-term mechanisms, which uh, include the renal body fluid uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, with the test durations that we typically look at of 30 minutes or even up to an hour, uh, we typically look at short-term uh, mechanisms that control blood pressure. Um, so usually the control is from autonomic centers in the brain, the ANS, and then um, the uh, changes are mediated uh, through a sympathetic and parasympathetic innovation. Um, simplified, we can say that heart rate is influenced by chronotropic uh, um, uh, changes and by um, uh, vasovagal or cardiovagal control. Stroke volume and vascular resistance are typically controlled by sympathetic, sympathetic uh, control. 
Um, so why are these parameters actually of interest to you? Um, there's been publications uh, uh, mentioning that blood pressure, cardiac output, and vascular resistance are important cardiovascular correlates uh, of the human uh, uh, circulatory system in response to uh, threat or exercise or even uh, emotional responses. And so the example here shows um, if a task, for example, is perceived as a positive challenge, you will typically see an increase in cardiac output in these subjects, while you will see a decrease in uh, peripheral resistance. So in total, blood pressure may increase slightly, but a very distinct increase in cardiac output. However, if somebody receives a task or perceives a task as a threat, um, you will only see maybe the little changes in cardiac output, but actually we will see an increase in vascular resistance. So for both these patterns, we might see small changes or increases in uh, blood pressure, but there is actually two completely different patterns behind that. And in order to distinguish and to understand what, how blood pressure is regulated and which causes uh, rises or falls in blood pressure, um, we need to, to measure these, uh, these four parameters in the equation. So blood pressure, um, pulse rate, um, stroke volume, and vascular resistance. In scientific research and clinical routine, I think it's essential to have a reliable solution and also reproducible data. And that is the reason why CNAV is equipped with a number of features to provide you with uh, consistent results. Um, first of all, the integrated upper arm cuff calibrates CNAV to brachial pressures at heart level. Second, the design of finger sensors ensures easy and optimal sensor setup, so nothing can go wrong with sensor setup. And it allows also for uh, long-term measurements because we can alternate from one to the other finger. Third, the forearm assembly of CNAV is designed in a way to allow even hand movement during measurement. So with this easy setup integration, I think CNAP can really be a perfect tool to upgrade your research projects uh, with a full set of hemodynamic parameters. I'm now going to hand over to Fraser, who is going to show you to interface CNAP with PyOPEX MP150-160 units, and he will also show you sophisticated analysis in the Acknowledge software. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for that great presentation on the CNAP technology and the NIBP100D. My part of the presentation is going to be looking at integrating the technology that Walter has just been describing with other physiological signals. And the presentation is in two parts. The first part is looking at some of the theory and how the physical connections occur. And the second part will be a live demonstration and then looking at the acknowledged software. So Biopack makes a wide range of platforms for physiological monitoring. I'm going to be focusing on the MP160, MP150 system this morning, but you can interface the CNAP um, NIBP100D technology with many of these different platforms. So if you have specific questions about a different platform, please let us know. Um, in addition to physiological signals, we have many customers that interface with stimulus presentation systems. So whether you're using Superlabby Primal Presentation for stimulus presentation or virtual reality, the MP160 system can accept the trigger marks that come from the stimulus presentation system and synchronize those marks with the physiological data so that when you come in and do analysis, you can identify those marks and ensure that you're taking your measurements at the correct location. With the virtual reality systems we offer, you can also send the physiological data from the MP160 system into the virtual world, so you have a complete feedback loop. We know when things are happening in the world, and then subject data can be used to control what's happening in the world. 
if you're interested in combining eye tracking, it's also uh, possible to synchronize the eye tracking systems with the physiological data. On the left hand side we've got a static system so the eye tracker is facing the participant as they participate in a test or perform some task on a computer. And then you can also use the eye tracking glasses. These are SMI systems. In both instances the eye tracking data is synchronized with the physiological signals. And then it's also possible to monitor a participant's facial expressions as they take part in an experiment. So in real time the software will determine the facial expression and it will send that data to acknowledge real time and the data will appear as a calculated channel. And then finally we also have the ability to record, video record the participant or participants using single or multi-camera setups. And I'm going to be using the media capability today as part of the demonstration that I provide. And again, the video is synchronized with the other physiological signals and the stimulus presentation, eye tracking or facial expressions data. So how do we connect everything together? Well, Walt has already talked a little bit about the NIBP 100D. So in the background, we've got the main unit. In the foreground, we can see the participant's arm with the upper arm cuff, the controller, and the finger cuffs. On the side of the NIBP 100D is a connector. Has a, it's a blood pressure output. That connects to the DA100C. That's our general purpose transducer amplifier. DA100C and then we have a TCI105 which allows the cable from the NIBP 100D to connect into that. Once that cable is connected and you launch the software, you will receive a real-time continuous uh, pulse waveform and then Acknowledge will display that and it can use it for real-time analysis, so systolic, diastolic, mean blood pressure and for further analysis after the um, recording is complete. If you're using the latest version, the NABP 100D HD, which is the hemodynamic version, the hemodynamic module has a number of additional outputs and we use a different cable to interface. That cable connects to one side of the CNAP monitor. The other end of that cable has four connectors and each of those connectors can contain a different hemodynamic signal. We connect those to an in-ISO. The output port on the CNAP that is used for the hemodynamics is an unisolated signal. So we use the in-ISO which is an isolated interface and that provides optical isolation between these, um, the monitor, the blood pressure monitor, and the subject. The system comes with four in ISOs, and those will allow you to record any combination of the blood pressure waveform that we've already seen, cardiac output, stroke volume, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, or systemic vascular resistance. You can have any of four of those signals displayed in real time. If you're performing stimulus presentation, you'll need an STP100C module. This particular module provides optical isolation between the computer that's delivering the stimulus presentation or running the virtual reality experiment and the participant and basically we run a ribbon cable to the back side of the STP100C and when you're using Superlab, E-Prime, Visit for virtual reality or presentation, each time stimuli are presented to the participant, a trigger is delivered to the STP100C and recorded as one of the channels for further analysis. Again, 
the physiological signals and the event mark information is all recorded in the same file. The trigger that comes in is visible during the actual experiment itself and can be used for further analysis. Once you've finished recording your data, we then have additional analysis tools within the software. The primary ones for blood pressure are the arterial blood pressure and estimation of cardiac output. These are beat by beat analysis routines that will measure, score the waveform, and then output the values either to an Excel spreadsheet to the journal file, which is part of Acknowledge, or you can display the measurements as new channels of data. And then finally, we have the Barrow reflex sensitivity. These, there are two methods, the sequence and the slope. They are licensed features within Acknowledge, so they don't come with a standard version, they're licensed. And I'll be demonstrating the slope analysis as part of my live demonstration. So hopefully what you can see on my screen right now, on the left hand side you'll see Acknowledge running and you'll see the physiological signals. The top channel is the blood pressure waveform which is coming from the NIBP100D. Channel 2, the blue channel, is ECG, that's a lead to ECG waveform. Channel three is electrodermal activity. And if I ask my participant to take a nice deep breath for me, we can see we're getting a nice electrodermal response. I've got the auto scaling set up so that it's automatically scaling that display to make it a little bit easier. And then below there we have systolic, diastolic, mean, and heart rate, and those are being calculated in Acknowledge on a beat-by-beat -beat basis. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the camera, and this is my hand right in front. This is live right now. Um, on the left-hand side, this is the NIBP100D. This is what Walter was showing you in his presentation before. Then I've got an MP160 system. And then next to that, I've got the DA100C with the TCI105. And then I've got a cable that runs from the TCI105 round the back to the far side of the NIBP100D. Next to that, I've got an ECG100C amplifier. And my participant is wearing uh, electrodes for um, lead two. So it's a chest lead configuration that I'm running. And then for EDA, I've got two electrodes on the palm of my participant. You can just see the electrodes there. This is the forearm controller on the top, finger cuffs down here, and then in the background we can see the software. And you'll notice that the, in the Acknowledge software we can see the numbers being updated. Those are going to be slightly off from what you're looking at in the monitor. There's a slight update rate uh, difference between the monitor and what you're seeing in the software, but the actual values that come in are accurate real-time blood pressure values. So how do I set this up? For the media part, um, I've, got, I've got the system set up using um, the camera that I've got connected to my computer. This is a Microsoft webcam. I select an output file name and the location to record it. And this is just a very simple webcam. You can save the file in a WMV or an AVI format. If I want to record audio, I can. And I can have different camera configurations. Then once I've got the camera set up, I just enable the show capture viewer, and that's what we're seeing on the right-hand side over here. And as far as the software is set up, I'm just going to minimize this, maximize my display. We go to the MP160 menu, we select set up data acquisition. And the way Acknowledge works, it allows you to add new modules. I've got the three modules set up. I've got my DA100C for the blood pressure, which is connected to the NIBP100D. If I want to start from ground zero, I can select add new module. I pick 
the DA100 from my list, select Add. I choose the channel that I want to record the data on. Then the system will ask me to confirm that I've got the amplifier set up accordingly. This is looking at a bandwidth between DC and 300 hertz. I've got a gain set to 1000. And down below, we need to tell the system what I'm connecting to the DA100. In this case, it's the NIBP100D. When I select OK, it adds this channel to channel 7. The system has been scaled so that when the data comes in, it's read in millimeters of mercury. That is um, scaled based on the factory presets for the NIBP100D. And we can do the same for the EDA. If we add a new module, we come down, EDA100C, we add, we pick a channel, hit OK. Now for this module, we're given the, the same information regarding the amplifier setup. I'm running it between DC and 10 hertz, and I've got the gain set to 5 microsiemens. At this point, I hit OK, and I'm given, um, I'm told to connect the electrode leads to the amplifier, but not to the subject or the electrodes. And normally, um, if I was setting this up correctly, I would follow that. Then I hit calibrate, and then I'm told to connect the electrode leads to the electrodes. So this automatically scales everything for the participant. And then ECG, there's no scaling required for that. It follows the same protocol. So I'm just going to remove these. So the setup is quite straightforward. The other thing that I'm going to do is put in a couple of the event marks. So I've got this set up so that when I hit the F1 key, a long arrow will appear on the blood pressure waveform, and it will put a label in there for start. And then I've set the function key to F2, the same long arrow, but it will uh, apply the label stop. Oh, there was one other thing I should mention. When you use the NIBP100D, there's a 50 millisecond delay in getting the data into the system, and we have an auto correction here. So this corrects to make sure that the blood pressure signal is synchronized and aligned with the other physiological signals that we're recording. And that happens there automatically when that radio button is selected. So then when we come back over to our display, I'll set this back up again and turn on my display. I hit start and now we're recording our data again. Again, if I ask my participant to take a nice deep breath for me, and we can see we're getting an electrodermal response, which is very nice. What I'm going to do now is ask my participant, Brenton, to perform a Volsalva maneuver. So when I ask you to start, I'm going to hit the F1 key, and we'll mark it. So go ahead. So I've applied the F1 key. It's placed a label in there. I'm going to turn some of these other channels off. and hit F2. So the event marks will allow us to come in and analyze this. So we can see the different phases that Walter described during this Valsalva maneuver. If I stop my recording, I can come into the media and select the playback viewer. And if, my, if I have the camera on my participant, I can select this portion of the recording, I can hit play, and now the cursor will scroll through the recording, and we can see what was happening at any moment in time. I can stop the recording, the video, and I can advance my cursor to any moment, and it will 
guide us to the precise frame that correlates with that part of the physiological recording. Okay, so that gives us a, a quick overview of recording and setup. Now what I'm going to do is I'll close this out. I'm going to take a look at the analysis. So to do this, I'm just going to open another file previously recorded. This gives me a, a longer period of data to look at. So again, the top channel is the blood pressure waveform. Then we've got heart rate, pulse rate then systolic, diastolic, and mean blood pressure. In the analysis menu, there's an option under hemodynamics for arterial blood pressure. If I select that option, the software asks me to identify the channel number that contains the blood pressure waveform. And in this case, it's channel one. I'm going to enter a recovery period of 75%. I do not have an ECG waveform with this file, and I want to analyze the entire graph. Software asks me to identify one blood pressure cycle, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So now I've selected one cycle, the systole. I hit systole as selected. And this is output my measurements, my results into Excel. This is column by row, so each row rec represents a new cycle, a new measurement. And then the measurements are the cycle number, the time, systolic, diastolic, and mean blood pressure, pulse height, which is the difference between the diastolic and the systolic, heart rate, ejection time, time to peak, and then from the first derivative, we have DPDT max and DPDT min, and then our 75% recovery. And this was user selected. I, I entered 75%. We come back over to the data. We can see that the software has marked with an asterisk or a star the systolic point in the recording. With a D, it's marked the diastolic point, and then it's put our recovery point at the appropriate place. And I can add some marks to help identify that. So now I've just put little uh, lines on the waveform so we can see the exact point. And we've also created this new channel here. This is the first derivative, DPDT. Um, this was used to determine the DPDT max and DPDT min values. We also have the ability to perform an estimation of cardiac output. So to do that, we go back to the analysis menu and hemodynamics, and we select estimate cardiac output. Select my blood pressure channel. I've got three options for the initial reading. The first one is the average reading for a male, which is 5.6 liters a minute. We can do the same for the female, or if I'm using a unique population, then I can add my own custom value as the starting point. I can do this over the entire graph. I can export to Excel, to the journal, create graph channels, or I can do any combination of the above. I'm just going to output it to Excel. I can also run the blood pressure analysis from this particular dialog, but I've already done that, so I'm just going to hit OK. So now, again, we've got the columns and rows, cycle number, start time, heart rate, cardiac output, and stroke volume on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis. You can also take simple readings. This is measurement is set to look at um, pulse, um, pulse rate, and I'm going to select mean. So now I've got this window set up. If I highlight an area of data, the software is taking the mean heart rate over this um, selected area, the mean systolic value, 
the mean diastolic value, the mean mean blood pressure, and that is over a five second time period. And if I auto scale everything, we can manually come through highlighting areas, I can open a journal file, and I can paste those measurements down into the journal, like so. Or I can automate this process. To automate it, I come into the analysis menu. I use epoch analysis. I'm going to use a fixed time interval. So I want to take the measurement every 10 seconds from the beginning of my graph. I don't want an interval between measurements. I want it to jump 10, 10, 10 all the way through. And I'm going to paste this down into the journal file over the entire graph. And I'm going to add the mean heart rate and the mean systolic blood pressure as examples. I hit OK. And the software, if I maximize this, has run through taking 10 second measurements of the mean heart rate and the mean systolic blood pressure. And that can be done around events. The software can identify events that you've placed in the data, or it can be done across a time period, such as the example I just gave. Now, finally, we're going to look at the baroreflex sensitivity. As I mentioned in my presentation, you need two signals for this. One of them is ECG, and the other one is the pressure waveform. This is coming from the NIBP100D. Going to select a period of data. If we come into the analysis menu, back into hemodynamics, we have two options here. One is the sequence. The one I'm going to show is the slope. The software will perform an analysis of the ECG waveform, and it will also analyze the blood pressure. So I have to identify the two channels. Hit OK. I'm going to highlight one of the blood pressure waveforms. OK, so now with this particular display, what we're looking at is the systolic um, blood pressure value for one particular cycle, and we're looking at the corresponding R to R interval, or the heart rate interval. Um, this is displayed in milliseconds, and the systolic is in millimeters of mercury. I can identify by clicking on one of these waveforms, one of these dots rather, and the software will take me to the exact points in the data that it's measured. So I can click on any of these and we can see the point. It takes us to the data point down here so I can see that was 24 seconds into the recording. The heart rate interval is 1130 milliseconds or 1.1 seconds and the systolic blood pressure was 90, almost 95 millimeters of mercury. If I've got some outliers that I want to remove I can either remove them by identifying the particular um, point and then using the Alt key, or I can turn it off from the display here. And what you'll notice, the slope line is immediately updated to reflect the change. So if I remove some of these, we can see the slope line and the sensitivity is changing. So this is a real-time update. Not only does it show us the actual waveform that we've identified, but it also updates our values. Okay, so that's the baroreflex uh, sensitivity analysis, the slope method. So now I'm going to just go over a quick summary of what we've looked at today. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, the premise behind the presentation is how easy it is to combine non-invasive blood pressure with a wide variety of signals, including stimulus presentation, uh, systems such as E-prime super presentation, and virtual reality. 
We can combine eye tracking so that we can look at the eye position, gaze path, and then also include facial expressions. And then finally, the ability to record all of these signals and maintain synchronization across all the different devices and the different signals. And that's all managed through the MP160 and the Acknowledge software. Okay, Andy, I'm going to hand back over to you for our question and answer session. Right. Uh, let's get right into it. Um, a question comes from Victoria at the University of Texas Medical Branch, um, and she's asked if you could compare the CNAP system to Finipress technology or a finometer. Uh, yes, certainly happy to do so. Um, well, basically, Finipress was developed like 30 years ago, and the technology hasn't changed much over time. Um, the basic principle uh, that lies behind uh, measuring blood pressure on the subject's fingers is called vascular unloading and uh, also Benes principle and that's uh, common amongst all these units also for CNAP. However, there are distinct differences between Phenopress and uh, CNAP I would like uh, to emphasize on. Um, one is the finger sensors on Phenopress technology are single finger sensors and they are wrapped around the finger using a Velcro while CNAP is using a fixed sensor. Um, so the setup uh, using these Velcro sensors is tricky on one hand, and also um, the Velcro, how tight you pull it, influences your results, so your readings. Um, secondly, um, Finopress lacks um, calibration. So basically, the finger blood pressure is reconstructed, or uh, is used to reconstruct brachial pressures using a digital filter. This digital filter is uh, trained with a cohort of patients, but uh, it really depends on uh, arterial elasticity in your subjects and may be different in your subjects. While CNAB uses a full upper arm cuff to calibrate on it. And then third, and I think most importantly, to track rapid changes in blood pressure, um, Phenopress uses something called a physiocal and uh, so what they do is the uh, blood pressure monitoring is interrupted um, time by time over the course of 10, between 10 and 70 beats, and uh, then is sensing the pressure signal up and down, it closes the loop again and monitors continuously again. So basically with physical on you will uh, get interruption in your measurements of, um, within 10 or up to 70 second uh, 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 gaps, while uh, CNAP does the same or similar thing in the background, but it just does not interrupt the monitoring. It just keeps going continuously. Okay. And I think these are the main differences. Perfect. No, that's, uh, that's a comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, Fraser. Uh, during registration and also during today's uh, presentation, many uh, attendees are curious if these systems could be used during exercise. Um, so I think the question is um, if you could address if this is possible, but maybe also um, touch on what might be important f uh, to ensure quality data collection. Yeah, you can definitely use the CNAP technology while a subject is performing exercise. The, the primary issue really is making sure that you avoid a lot of artifact. So if the arm is moving around a lot rapidly, you will get um, artifacts on the signals and it will make it difficult to analyze the actual blood pressure data. So we recommend um, securing the arm in a sling and then dependent upon the type of exercise, so if you're on a recumbent bike or something like that, the arm is in a sling, it's kept at heart height which is good, maintains a consistent height of the um, sensor and then the participant can exercise and you'll record reliably throughout the entire exercise so you get before, during and recovery phases without a problem. And not just a recumbent bike, it can be other forms of exercise, but the thing to avoid is really bouncing that cuff around. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Um, and actually an extension of this, uh, Hugo Pereira has asked, um, uh, well, he's explained he is doing um, uh, measurements or he's using this equipment to, during exercise, but they're short bouts of exercise, approximately a minute. 
And he's saying that his challenge is um, the CNAP arm cuff and doing the calibration during that one minute exercise. Consequently, he loses, uh, say, 20 seconds of, of data during that equipment calibration. So his question is, is there any way to avoid the inflation of the arm cuff during each bout of exercise? Or perhaps is there another workaround so he can, can capture um, everything for the one minute uh, of recording for each subject? Yeah, I mean, within the um, CNAP monitor, you can control when the blood pressure uh, calibration and the finger switch occurs and you can push it out there for as long as 60 minutes so you should be able to find a time within that 60 minute segment where uh, you can manually invoke a calibration so you pick a period where you know it doesn't matter mm. you select to perform the calibration at that point and then you can carry on with your recording but if you're only doing a one minute period, you shouldn't have to worry about the calibration as long as you set the interval long enough. Okay. So pushing um, it out. I, I, I totally agree on that. And uh, I think CNAP is good to run over longer distances uh, with a calibration that is done in the beginning. So what they need to make sure is calibrate in the beginning as often as they like. But then during the test, uh, as I've shown in my presentation, and also during the one minute, for example, exercise, just uh, keep uh, recording continuous data from the finger sensor and just make sure that the NIPB cuff uh, is, uh, doesn't kick in uh, during that minute. Um, also bear in mind, uh, I mean, if uh, the subject's uh, blood pressure alters due to exercise, an upper arm cuff anyways cannot measure blood pressure very accurate. So what you want to do is calibrate in the beginning and just don't calibrate during the exercise period. Perfect. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, next question. Um, how well does this technology uh, work with people that have cold fingers during measurements? So for those research studies where that might be uh, the case or just in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, of course, CNAV is depending on blood flow in the patient's fingers, so we want to make sure uh, um, we have blood flow, so uh, there is no, for example, uh, vascular shock or something. Um, in general, CNAV picks up the signal very well. Um, as soon as uh, the pulsation index turns green at measurement startup, it's an indication to get a signal. And what we also hear from clinical customers that use CNAP, for example, during surgeries, etc., once CNAP is able to pick up a signal, it will not lose a signal. It will stay with your recording. And that's an important fact. Um, if, for example, CNAP does not get a reading in the beginning, just check the cuff sizing of the finger sensor. Make sure the um, forearm controller is positioned well. I'm sure in 99% of, of subjects you will get good readings. Perfect. Uh, very good. Um, another question, uh, Fraser, for you. How would one go about measuring pulse transit time and would they need uh, any additional equipment perhaps that wasn't shown today to do so? Um, with the pulse waveform that's coming from the NIBP100D, you obviously you're going to record that and then you'll also record ECG and then the software will identify the QRS, the peak of the QRS, the R wave, and identify the peak of the pulse signal. And we can do um, using the fine cycle peak detector, which is part of the Acknowledge software, we can identify both these points and then you can calculate the time interval between the peak of the QRS, the R wave, and the peak of the uh, pulse waveform. So you're sort of looking at the electrical from the heart versus the mechanical, the blood pressure, and then you can calculate the distance from the heart to the fingertip by just simple measurement. Perfect. And we have, actually, we have an application note that walks people through the entire an analysis. Okay, great. Perhaps we, we can link to that in the Q&A report as well. Um, sure. Great. Uh, 
I'm going to ask two final questions. Um, we've had a lot of stuff come in, um, and again, all of this will be included in the Q&A report, whatever we don't get to right now. Uh, quick question, Walter, does the arm cuff need to stay on the subject after calibration and during the whole um, study? Or could it technically um, be removed? Or? Technically, you could remove it. Um, as we said before, I mean, make sure you calibrate CNAP in the beginning using the upper arm cuff, mm -hmm. and then during your experiment or test, or even before that, you could take it off. Make sure um, CNAP is set in a way that uh, the upper arm cuff is not triggered meanwhile. So if it bothers you, you can take it off. Um, basically, what we see is if it doesn't inflate, it really doesn't bother so much. You know, so mm -hmm. you can leave it on too. Okay, great. Uh, and then final uh, question, Fraser, um, can a researcher manually adjust the fiducial points on signals in Acknowledge? And I think the, the, what we're looking at here, or why the question's been asked, is would it be possible for a dis different signal, such as ECG, to be used to define waveform events, such as systole and diastole? Um, you're meaning if you're analyzing the wrong channel? Well, I think, I think the way I interpret the question is, um, it, at part of your demonstration, you showed the fiducial points being put on the uh, ECG waveform, I believe, or no, it was the blood pressure waveform. Um, yeah. And um, I think the question is, could that same process be applied but use ECG? So that for analysis purpose, the fiducial points are, are determined by that waveform rather than blood pressure. Um, you can't identify the systolic from the ECG easily, but what the software will do, it will pick out the components of the ECG complex. Okay. So when I ran the baroreflex sensitivity analysis, the software goes through and scores the entire ECG. It needs to be a lead to ECG. Mm -hmm. It will identify the P, Q, R, S, T, beginning of P, the peak of the P wave, end of the P wave, beginning of T, end of T, etc. And it also does the same with the blood pressure. So you get the systolic, the diastolic, and the percentage user-defined recovery point. So they are um, identified within the ECG waveform. That, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. The part that I think may be related to this is if the software has misplaced or hasn't placed, because typically what will happen if the software is unable to identify part of the complex, it won't guess. It will just, it won't mark it because it's unable to do so. But with the human eye, sometimes you can identify where that point is. You can then manually apply the mark or you can move a mark that you think may be slightly off.